Thank you very much for coming along. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge we meet on the lands of the Ghana people and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge that the Ghana people did not cede this land. So thank you very much for coming along to our July public talks program. And um, we thank uh, Dr. Matthew Shaw for uh, his attendance tonight and his presentation. And we're also going to have a short presentation from Mike Moore, uh, and he'll um, give a little talk about his research. So we look forward to hearing from Mike. So I'm actually going to talk about Linnaeus tonight. So um, and mo most, many, lot of you will know quite a lot about Linnaeus. So you probably won't learn anything tonight, although I doubt that because actually I learned a bit on the weekend about it. So that's always good, isn't it? Okay, so welcome to my talk, Taxonomy Part 1. Um, you may well have recognised that I haven't spoken for the last couple of months, but all good things come to an end and I'm back <laughs> now to talk to you. So, okay. Um, Taxonomy, the science of and rules for the classifying of things or ideas. Um, we tend to use taxonomy, of course, mainly in the, in the living sciences, but there are taxonomies in a whole host of other things. Jerry, could you just come and help move this little thing here? Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, to go through a, a whole lot of them at all. Um, it's just that if you've done any work in education, then you would be well aware of uh, Bloom's taxonomy with regards to uh, the use and reading of the English language. So um, most taxonomies are hierarchies. In other words, um, uh, we've got an upper level which contains those levels below it. And I'll demonstrate that a little bit more later on. Okay, um, but not all of them are, okay. Um, taxonomies can be directed in different ways. Remember, it's the classification, the rules for the organisation of things. Okay, that's basically what a taxonomy is. And there are a number of ways that you can do this, and there are a number of different um, ideas that you can use in their construction. Now, I hate hearing myself. As a matter of fact, I feel so sorry for you lot out there. It's unbelievable. But nonetheless, the world has just granted us this. Carl Linnaeus, okay, 1707 um, to 1778, with, is, is credited with it inventing the modern system. The interesting thing is that he didn't really invent the idea, as you'll see a little bit later on, and nor actually do we use strictly his, uh, the scheme that he originated now. But he had, the, he had the idea, he moved people in the right way. His scheme was hierarchical, and we still use that today. And of course, there's this thing called binomial nomenclature, which he... Um, which is naming things using two names, hence binomial. So let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at that. <laughs> oh, there we go. Oops, let's go back there. Okay, um, just look at the name there. If I sell us and you were Ramos, Ramosissima, Ramos angulosus glabris folius dentoceratus. Okay, now this was the name or the names given to this plant before 1735, and basically um, it means that um, it's an annual flower or it grows annually. It's branched. The branches come out at angles and glabrous means smooth, so they're hairless branches. And the, the, um, uh, the leaves, or folus can mean flowers, but in this case it means leaves, are dentoserratus. They're dentated and serrated, okay? 
as you can see, that's a bit of a mouthful, you know, going going into a, uh, a nursery and asking for this and a few other plants might take you most of the time you've set aside. So um, what Linnaeus did was to convert this into, um, oh, sorry. Now, that was the name given in... Uh, by Linnaeus in, in uh, 1758 to the wild gooseberry, which was an American plant, comes from the southern United States. And when you think about it, you know, American um, things would have just been getting into Europe to be named. But after 1758, it was simply called Physalis angulata. And uh, over on the left there, I've got um, uh, a butterfly, um, Agyrus amaryllis. And um, Agyrus is the genus name, Amaryllis is the species name, and that is the basis of Linnaeus's binomial system. It's made up of two names, one which is the genus, one which is the species. Okay. Um, this system had been dabbled with in the 1500s, which when you think about it, you know, this is the mid 1700s or the early 1700s. 200 years earlier, people had come up with the idea that you could name things just using two names. And of course, we use binomial names, of course, ourselves. Okay, um, that's, that's me. Um, okay, I'm, the genus is more, uh, and the specific name is Michael. Um, I can even be more specific, of course, by putting my middle name in there too. But it's actually, it's interesting that many cultures um, on earth actually put the genus name first. And so um, that even fits more tightly into this binomial naming system. Fan Feng was actually the, the young lady who constructed our, um, our second website. So, He used a hierarchical system. In other words, the one at the top contains everything below. So, the, so in a kingdom, there are classes, orders, genera, and species. In classes, there are orders and genera and species. In, in the genus, there are numbers of species, but there's only one specific thing called that species. Okay, so that's what we mean by a hierarchical system. Um, now, we've added extra, and as you can see there, we've added quite a bit. Um, uh, phylum, family, tribe, subgenus, subspecies. Not all of these are used all the time, but particularly in the insect world, it, um, it's particularly useful, for instance, to use tribes and things like that. Okay. So if we look at this butterfly here, this is in the kingdom Animalia, so it's in the animals. Phylum Arthropoda, okay, so that includes insects, crustaceans, centipedes, spiders, um, uh, and millipedes, and a few other things too. It's in the class Insecta, or well, most of us would be well aware of that. The order Lepidoptera. There are other orders in the class and sector, and of course they're beetles and dragonflies and wasps, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's in the tribe, Candelinidae, or Candelinidae, okay. Um, uh, the genus has just been changed, actually, in the last year. It used to be Candelides, but uh, Mike Braby has done quite a lot of research on this group of butterflies, and... Um, where there was one genus, there are now four. And this particular species has been put in the genus Erina. Subspecies Hyacinthina. Okay. Uh, Mike's very, very particular on matching. If it's a female genus, then the species name's got to be female too. And um, the same with the subspecies name. And he's very, very precise on this. So Hyacinth... Hyacinthinus has now become Hyacinthina. That's one of the few changes you can make. This butterfly will always be called Hyacinthina, Synthinus, um, even if it changes its genus as it now has, and subspecies Simplexa. Oops, we're almost finished. 
Um, he was mainly interested in identifying things. And so if you look at Linnaeus's plant keys, his plant keys are based on this plant has got one stamen in its flowers. This, these plants have got two, these have got three, these have got four or five. Now, those ideas are not strictly ideas on relatedness, okay? They're useful for identifying things, but they're not quite as good for showing relationships. And these days, we're much more interested in our taxonomy reflecting relationships, not just identifying them, okay? And um, these days, of course, we can use DNA, and we do. And the DNA helps us find those relate relationships between organisms, okay? And so if we take a, a interesting things happen, for instance, uh, if we take a bird example, um, magpie larks or mud larks, whatever you like to call them, um, it's actually been quite a while now, probably about 15 or 20 years, but we now realise that they're more closely related to wagtails and fantails than we thought they were in the past. Okay, so sometimes relationships are hidden, um, but DNA helps us investigate that a little bit more. Linnaeus definitely laid the skeleton for modern taxonomy. And this is a bit that I really liked. I mean, in 1735, um, he, he created the genus Homo for humans. So he recognised that we were animals. And not only that, he actually put Homo in the same group as the apes, which um, he called Simia then, um, and he and he made this group called Anthro Anthropomorpha. That name was disagreed with because Anthropomorpha means like a human, and people said, "Well, obviously a human looks like a human. This is a bit of a silly name." So he actually changed it. And in the 10th edition of this, he actually replaced it with the term primates. But um, this comes from uh, that little image there. Um, just um, uh, it comes from the 10th the edition from 1758. Last thing I'm going to say now, before you've got any questions, species also carry the name of the describers. So I don't know whether we'll be seeing any mites with the uh, Shaw 2020 written after them tonight, but um, Matthew would have named a number of mites in his career. And those mites will carry Matthew's name with them um, forever, really. And generally we put the year that um, uh, this species was named. I always think it's very interesting with um, with the English language, though. I mean, you know, we, we try to reduce names. So, for instance, um, you know, more famous people get called by one name, you know, Einstein and Pelle and things like that, and everybody knows who they are. And I always find it interesting that with Linnaeus, and Linnaeus named probably 10,000 things in his life, we just put a little L. <laughs> so we've even reduced that one name to something less. So anyway, so um, I don't know. I, I hope I've introduced it well. I'd, I want to talk a little bit more about, um, you know, sort of probably more meaty and meaningful taxonomy a bit later. Uh, not tonight, of course, fortunately for you. Um, and um, anyway, yeah.